Hello, I'm Josh Baer, and welcome to the Bear Facts Podcast. In this mid-year review episode, Will Yang and I talk about what's been going on with the art market in 2023. Is this a slowdown, a major correction, or not? I'll compare our current situation with some insights from the art market's real crash in the 90s when I close my gallery. I'll also share my takes on the current art business news and my recent trip to Asia. Josh, when we talk about the first half of 2023, what will be the first thing coming to your mind? The first thing that comes to mind is people are comparing it to 2022 and 2021. So I think whenever you're comparing something to a big high, anything that's retraction from that is assumed to be a big low. And I think we're just at the 80, 90% level of a high. So I think that's still a stronger situation than people think. My, my second point is this is really the first summer that the art world has really had off because we were on a uh, 724, 365 schedule through the last three summers with COVID. And now people, I think, are really ready for a little bit more of a break. So that's sort of like, a, another slowdown thing that I think is more an illusion than a big reality. Do you think when people are going to uh, their summer holiday with a little bit pressure for the second half of this year, or they're optimistic? I think they're just taking a breather from even thinking about it, and we'll come back at it in September a little bit more. And then November and the art fairs in the fall will really be the indicator. We don't have enough data right now to really say where we are. I think it's a little bit more doomsday than it might be at the moment in the discussion. I'm looking at the numbers that Christy just released recently, about two weeks ago of their first half of 2023. Their total sales uh, globally is 3.2 billion. And compared to the same time in 2020, that's about 23% down. And I actually look at the numbers from last year, Salisbury had their record selling total $8 billion in 2022. I know you wrote about and we talk about those numbers that are total revenues. They don't publish profit. But do those numbers mean something? And in the 23% down for Christie compared to a year ago, what does that tell us? Tell us that not enough rich people died. <laughs> okay, can you explain a little bit more? <laughs> because it's anecdotal. If suddenly uh, one of the top five collectors passed away and their heirs decided to come to market, you could get another billion dollars from one collection put into the market. And suddenly we would have been at four billion instead of three billion. So I think you have to see longer data points rather than anecdotal. Occasionally you'll see one of the auction houses saying, we beat the other side by $100 million of sales during the year. That could be one painting. So it's not a business that's selling hamburgers, that if you're off 12% in hamburger sales, well, you can't make it up with somebody being hungry tomorrow. So it's a different industry. The question, again, you raise about profitability, that's an important one, and they're not telling us. For a market observer or somebody who just came in with a financial background, without knowing the profit, if they wanted to observe a little bit more, what are the things they should pay attention to? Well, there's a great statistic that Guillaume Cerruti, the head of Christie's, talks about where you combine the percent sell-through rate of a sale with the pre-sale estimate of the low hammer. And if that gets over 200%, that's a successful sale. So I would ask them, what was that number for the first half of the year? And that would give you a sense of how successful they're doing. In the past uh, six months, you were in London and in New York covering the auctions. What did you see in the auction rooms especially this is kind of like a first season really after the pandemic. The May sales suffered a little bit 
from expectations of consigners when they made deals in January and February. So many auctions are put together three to four months before their their deals are put together before they go to market. So the ability to be nimble and to adjust the estimates or the terms of deals are a little bit restrictive sometimes to the deals they made. I would say the art galleries, private dealers and the art fairs, they're able to change their pricing and their deal structure 24 hours before they go public with anything. So that's a huge advantage they have is to adjust to the current market conditions on a moment's notice. And the auction houses suffered this year a little bit from the perception that sales were off because the deals they put forward in January didn't look quite the same in May. I remember you wrote before and you have said that everyone's a genius when the market is hot but the real pros shine during a slowdown. It's easy to buy things. You walk into the Gulfstream store and you say, here's $80 million, I'll give it to you. You walk into Cartier and you say, here's $800,000, you walk out the door. You walk into uh, you know, a gallery and auction house, they say it's available, you say, here's $80,000. Buying in general is pretty easy. And if you're just looking at comparable prices, you're seeing them rise. So you think, I'm a genius. Why don't I buy 10 more? And then you discover the hard part of the art business is selling art, not buying art. And it comes down to your piece. So people have uh, made fortunes and lost fortunes in this business. So you need to understand that art is not liquid. What advice would you give to those looking to sell an auction in this buyer's market? Well, a friend of mine who's a dealer and ran an auction house said to me, if you're a seller, you're a seller. So be willing to adjust your desires based on the realities of today. It means lower your deal, take an offer that's pretty good. As they say, bulls and bears make money, pigs get slaughtered. So. If you've got a deal that's close to your ask, I say, take it. Um, once you've decided to sell, go through till the end, because it generally it's going to take you five years to try to start again to sell the same thing. After the break, Josh compares our current market environment to the art market's only major crash in the late 90s. Later on, Josh and Liu Yang discuss how the art business of today is adapting to the market slowdown. Don't transact without the Bear Faxed. Subscribe to the Bear Faxed newsletter to receive the key developments in the art world and op-eds from Josh Bear in your inbox each Thursday, plus special auction editions direct from the sale room. The only report on who bought what and who tried to but didn't get it. Head to thebearfax.com to learn more and check out our full range of content offerings. You have witnessed upside down, so nothing surprises you. Um, what you see happening right now, maybe give us a little bit of reference to what you have seen in the past, which you see kind of similar. I think the art market was so close to completely going bust worldwide in the early 90s that all you have to do is see that Pace Gallery had to merge or was sold to Wildenstein and that Pace became Pace Wildenstein meant they were in trouble. And if such a top gallery at that point, that shows where we were 30 years ago, it wasn't just you know, uh, young whippersnappers like me, it really went through the art market like a, uh, like a global pandemic, like a virus. Who would think that could ever infect the art world? So which year was that? I think it was early 90s. So you had Japan fall off the map because they were causing inflation for the art market because it was all part of a corruption scheme to get payoff for, for real estate loans in Japan. So you put that factor there. You put um, Wall Street being under threat. You put um, the, what else was going on there? 
AIDS was certainly becoming a very powerful problem in the art market. And two of the biggest art collectors in contemporary art both died within a year, Frederick Ruiz of Sweden and Thomas Amann of Switzerland. For me, they were my two of my biggest clients. Suddenly they're dead. That's going to hurt your business. And there were a lot of galleries, big clients. Well, a single new person can make the art market. If Jeff Bezos decides he wants to spend $5 billion on art next year, which he could, that would affect it. If the Sheikha and, and Cutter decided she wasn't buying art next year, the art market could absorb their stepping out. Was that around the time that you had to close down your gallery? Yes. So it was all part of that, and everybody was struggling. Just about. But interesting, that's also the time that new galleries open. So that's the same coming out of it. That's when David's Werner opened. That's when Hauser and Wirth opened. So crisis can be opportunity. And it was a, a period that they could start with less expectations and grow into the next wave. So it was also uh, a golden age of young dealers coming in, particularly those two galleries. How long did it take for, you know, everybody to recover or what kind of process did it take? And the new gallery back then, like you mentioned, uh, David Zoner, uh, how did they start to take the opportunity to turn the crisis into opportunity? Well, they were able to grow organically without having to look at what the other guy was doing, like, oh, they did a party for $50,000, I have to do one. They could stick to really the nuts and bolts of showing art and talking about art. Then there was the hiccup, 2001, with like a hiccup in terms of the market with 9-11, and that froze everything. And then there was a hiccup in 2008 with Lehman Brothers, and that froze everything. And those corrections were, were shorter than people thought. And then COVID, Everybody thought in March of 2020, we might all be out of business. That didn't take. So we've had enough volatile threats that the art market has survived since the last, I would say, pretty much collapse, which was 30 years ago. So I don't see a collapse happening. And people who live through that are always looking around the corner a little bit more to see things can happen. Because art always exists, right? When art exists, the art market exists. Art can exist without the art market. Art market can exist without art. Yes. After the break, we'll discuss current art business news in the context of the market, including Freeze's acquisition of the Armory Show and Expo Chicago, Gagosian Gallery, and even the Barbie movie. Don't transact without the bare facts. Consider bundling your newsletter subscription with access to our auction database, the only platform that lets you know who bought what and who tried to but didn't get it, with over 12,000 data points going back to 1994. Head to thebearfacts.com to learn more. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the recent news in the art market. You mean that Barbie movie opened today? That's the big news. <laughs> Performance art is back in a big way. I think if you count Barbie as performance art, that the total value of the art market this year is about to go up about $500 million just this weekend. I know you have tickets and you'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> there was a VIP preview at Gagosian Gallery last night, $25,000 a ticket to see Barbie. Everything was pink? Everything was pink. The champagne was pink. You know, Larry was dressed in pink. It was a great evening for the art world. And it wasn't even a charity event. Well, how about another news? Um, Phrase has acquired the, the Arbery Show in New York and in process of uh, buying Expo Chicago, two of the largest and the longest running fairs in, in U.S. I wonder, what was your first reaction when you saw the news? I think my first reaction was, huh? Because Freeze has a fair in New York and the Armory Show is a fair in New York. And what's the strategy behind that? So I think that's yet to be articulated. I 
think the strategy of Expo Chicago being sold makes sense because with doing just one project a year, it's an inefficient setup for them. And so their cost of, of marketing and sales and other things are decreased by spreading that across many other art fairs that they can shrink their operating costs. So I think we're early into the um, decision-making of Endeavor. I would say this is a low-value acquisition on their side of a company that's got, I don't know, a billion dollars worth of companies and assets. So a five, 10 or $20 million deal has some other ramifications that they see brand building for the whole company more than the profit and loss they might take out of it. And th those are my first thoughts. Yeah, the news came out um, like a month after we released our two episodes on our fairs. One of the main topics that we cover was you know, international art fairs versus regional in terms of uh, the development of art fairs globally. Do you see this is a new trend compared to, you know, um, past few decades that when you have been witnessing the, the development of the fairs? I see a different trend. I see the trend towards more mega businesses. So in the same way the galleries have become mega galleries, the same way that you see, well, I'm sure you'll ask me about Periton selling a share to private equity. You're seeing businesses that want to increase in verticals and increase in horizontals coming together. So I think we'll see more consolidation of that. Will Gagosian Gallery wind up being part of some other luxury um, company? I think there's a chance of that, certainly, as they've gone more corporate with the board of directors in a more corporate environment. I'm sure they're looking at the Periton deal, saying, how does that relate to us? So I think in the context of art fair acquisitions, I think in terms of media companies acquiring other products, in terms of fintech companies coming into the space, in terms of Christie's, for instance, spending money to invest in art-related technologies, that we're going to see more complex businesses than just mom and pop businesses that we always had. Art Forum was a mom and pop magazine. Now it's part of Penske. Pace was one gallery. Now there are 700 galleries. So I think we see more and more consolidation into a few winners and broad parts to the same business as what's going to be going forward for the next three to 10 years. But obviously only certain number of large galleries can afford to do that or have resource to do that, right? And what does that mean to the middle-sized galleries or smaller ones, the young galleries? I think they're going to wind up being more mergers where they can take of their 20 artists each combine their staffs, work with 30 artists. Instead of two registrars, they have one. Instead of having two PR contracts, they have one. So I think as people get a little bit more exhausted trying to run their own modest-sized business together, we'll see more and more of them consolidating on their own and having more um, one plus one equals three for galleries too. And the relationship between galleries and artists, that's another topic I want to ask you. Artists have become rather fungible for galleries. When they become bigger, they ride up together, they ride down. I wonder when artist cooperatives are sort of going to come back, but not in a nonprofit way, but in a for-profit way. It's like, why do they need you know, to give 40 or 50% up to the galleries, maybe they can work together in some sort of way and work with galleries to sort of do that. So there's been some attempts with that in terms of them owning their own inventory, but I see that that's another possible route that artists might start to take. Hmm. But you know, artists are not famous, the most famous for people who can manage or organizing things in terms of forming a business, right? Who do you think will be the kind of ideal person or organization um, might be able to launch that? I think that only works when it's private and secret. So I don't think you'll see these kind of situations as much as they'll be behind the scenes. 
We'll see. I think it's also part, you can't totally separate that out from the digital um, NFT, blockchain, all those other issues, sort of implying that there's a way and need for the artist to have a little bit more say in the game. So I think as much as we talk too much about NFTs in relation and blockchain to money, there is something there about community and reaching a younger community. There's a younger community of collectors. I had a call from some 24-year-olds from college who've started a, a new business to do auctions and blockchain this and NFT that. And their point was collectors their age don't want to work the same way that collectors their grandparents' age want to work. Apparently, these young collectors don't even want to have the art. They like having wallets, digital wallets. They don't live in big spaces. They, the notion is they can't or don't even want to have in front of them the, the painting, the sculpture so much as they like to own it. They like to have the digital certificate for it. The NFT goes with it. But their experience with it is less personal, which I find weird. So I think that there will be, you know, people use the word disruption, which I think is maybe next to curating the, the worst word used in the art market. But I think there will be um, new ways of communicating and doing things. At the same time, us OGs will continue to do what we do in the same way because th there's you know, trillion and a half dollars of art already out there that needs its own existing structure. Join us after the break for the final part of our episode, where Liu Yang asks Josh about his recent travels throughout Asia and what's next for the market there. Don't transact without the bare facts. Consider bundling your subscription with our Art Advisory Membership Program, offering on-demand access to our diverse team of international specialists for a low annual fee, valued by both collectors new to the market and experienced players like galleries and even other advisors. Head to thebearfacts.com to learn more. Speaking of uh, uh, the young collectors, I remember reading Christie's half-year report. They said there are 31% of uh, their clients um, for the first half are the first time new clients. And among that 31%, I think if I remember correctly, 38% are the young collectors. True, but people are living longer too. So if you factor in that people are making it more to 80, 90 or 100, you know, how much is their buying power? And my question would be to parse that out. I'm sure you'll ask me about Asia, that a lot of that's probably coming out of Asia more heavily, new buyers and online buyers. Let's talk about Asia. I think that's definitely something new for lots of a first time for Josh for the past uh, six months, right? Oh man, I was in Asia in the 80s. Come on, everybody makes it like <laughs> I've never been there. <laughs> It's like, oh man, I was there before you were born. Asia is not the elephant in the room, but it, it is certainly critical to what's going on. And if you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril. I know, you know, Asia is not new to you, um, but being there, I remember January when two of us went to Singapore, you flew from New York, I flew from Germany. And I remember receiving the message when you were landing, like, wow. And then in March, when you were landing in Hong Kong, was like, you know, bigger wow. <laughs> uh, anything kind of, kind of unexpected or something that you thought that might look like and then, but turns out to be very different from what you pictured? It's um, certainly always more. So as a New Yorker, as we we're kind of nonplussed, Hong Kong was just city after city after city from the airport or in the plane, and you're not even in Hong Kong. Um, what, what I've been hearing about from some of my clients who've been going there for a long time in their own industries is there's a lot of cities in Asia with 10, 20, 30 million people that we've never heard of the cities. I think... When you learn a little something, you start to know what you don't know a little bit more clearly. So I don't know a lot. 
well, you definitely know durian and live octopus and, you know, eating hot pot in the middle of night in Kowloon side of Hong Kong, right? Snake soup was <laughs> particularly good. <laughs> Do you remember what you said to me um, when you landed in Hong Kong, one of the first things you said? Because that was uh, shortly after uh, China lived, uh, Hong Kong um, particularly lifted the travel restriction for foreigners going there. Um, I remember how much, you know, how impressed you were. It's hard to know what's really going on because I think particularly in Hong Kong, people have to be cautious about the, the government, the relationship of the economy to the colonial past and PRC. There's a lot going on there that's understood and not talked about at the moment. At the same time, Look at all those skyscrapers. Look at this industrial thing. Look at this mix of cultures. Look at the vibrancy and the energy that's waking up there, too. It's like, okay, that's that's a lot. You can't just pretend that that whole continent doesn't exist in your business anymore. And they're very different among all the cities and countries in Asia. We can't just generalize Asia, right? or China, or think of them in a monolithic way. And I wouldn't be doing it without you, Liang, because you can help us navigate that in a way that me, at my age, I wouldn't be able to. I remember there was a, the head of Sotheby's Contemporary Art in Hong Kong now, Alex Branchik, remember talking to Chan Westfall, who was the head of chairman of Sotheby's Europe about China, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And she said, I ain't going, but this Alex guy, he's 25. He's going all the time. And I think she made the right decision for her and he made the right decision for him. So I think you could start at zero. I'm sitting next to Will. He could be going twice a year for the next 40 years and find it on his own. At a, at a more mature level, you need to be um, guided in a really more sophisticated way. Thank you, Lu Yang, for doing that. Oh, you're very welcome. And I really enjoyed our trip to Asia, and I can't wait to go back there uh, with you and then to have more on-the-ground experience. Um, and speaking about Asian participants, I remember when we were in London in February carving the auction, you know, the, the participation from Asian bidders are quite strong. And the ones we just had witnessed in, in uh, last month in London as well. Um, so in your experience of going to Asia, your interaction with the Asian clients in Asia or Asian clients in New York and London, do you see any difference or what kind of characteristics among them? It's all about the Benjamins. It relates to how many people have their money in different places. Clearly, there's getting money out of mainland China for art has become more restrictive. There's a fear that that'll happen in Hong Kong. So the ability for the Asian diaspora to be as active in the art market is going to require some patience because it's got political headwinds potentially there that are not that stable. So I think it's a little less stable than it was a year ago. And many Asians thought ahead, and that's why they're in London or Paris or Miami or New York when they can. And just the ability to do business, given the uh, political environment between the US and China, China and Russia, Russia and the US is making everything a bit fragile and people have to be a little bit cautious in that way. Well, I noticed Basel, ground floor, opening day. The audience to me looked to be about 30% Asian. I remember that day, our newsletter, you wrote, our Basel is back, our Basel Hong Kong is back, because it feels like the first day in Hong Kong Basel. Yeah, I felt like I went to the opening of Art Basel Hong Kong in Basel. And, and that's a good thing, because that's about making the pie bigger. Um, for the art market, and the art market pie will get bigger. There's still new money coming in. People who collected forever are gonna keep collecting. New collectors are gonna buy, and it's still gonna get bigger. It just maybe needs some price corrections. 
I think the question going forward in the next six months is, are we now coming out of recovery going to work each in our own way, or is there going to be more collaboration going forward to not only be um, more efficient, but to, to survive? That's the post-COVID recovery to see. A year's a long time in the art business. Let's regroup after another six months. Thank you for listening to the Bear Facts Podcast, brought to you by the leading news source for the art world since 1994. Our host is Josh Bear. Our executive producer is Lu Yang Zhang. I'm Will Griffith, our assistant editor. Our content advisor is Bo Liang Shin. And our editing team is Mona Productions. Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts. And check back soon for future episodes as we unpack the inner workings of the global art industry through exclusive, candid interviews with key players in the business as they offer their perspectives on art and the market in the U.S., Asia, Europe, and beyond. Thank you.